thank you, uh, Dr. Khan, and thank you especially uh, to the Honourable Minister for his uh, his words. And uh, I was very pleased uh, to see that in the vision that he sketched for 2025, that there is such uh, substantial overlap with what the IGC seeks to to uh, contribute to and to work with you on uh, in the coming in the coming years. The mission of the IGC, as Dr. Khan uh, said at the outset, is to promote sustainable growth in developing countries and to do this in a different way. Developing countries don't suffer from a lack of advice, but they do suffer from a lack of engagement with partners that are able to work together with policymakers to discover the key questions that need to be addressed to promote growth and to begin together to formulate uh, answers. I hope and believe that IGC offers a partnership with governments that does bridge that knowledge doing gap. That IGC is not about pursuing knowledge, developing knowledge uh, for its own sake, but very much about working with policymakers and other stakeholders in a partnership aimed first at discovering the key growth challenges and the research questions linked to those challenges, but then at implement implementing strategies for addressing those in very practical ways, not, not in developing research projects that will only five years hence lead some uh, findings, perhaps ignored by all but uh, those in the field, but instead working closely with government and other stakeholders straight through that research process in a way that helps to inform uh, policy, that helps to change policy in real time as well as in the longer term. To do all this, the IGC has developed a new model, an innovative model for feeding research into policy, and it's a model that's been made possible only because of substantial support from the UK Department for International Development. Because it's a model which integrates on the one hand a global network of researchers, top researchers in growth and development from the world's leading universities, with on the other hand a sustained, we'd like to think permanent, country presence in 14 countries across South Asia and Africa. That sustained uh, country presence means that in contrast to what researchers sometimes do, what's uncharitably described as the mosquito uh, approach of flying in, sucking the blood and flying out, uh, that we seek to engage over the long term with policymakers both to develop an agenda together but also to respond to that to, to, to take the developing knowledge from that process and ensure that it passes into action, as the Minister quite rightly emphasized. Perhaps the best way to understand the potential contribution of the IGC is by looking at some examples of our engagement. Here in Pakistan, for example, uh, the Minister noted as the first plank of the 2025 plan the importance of world-class social and human capital. And the IGC, under the leadership of our country director, Dr. Nabi, has been instrumental in developing new strategies for skills development here in the, in the Punjab. The Minister also mentioned the importance of creating sustainable and inclusive growth and how fundamental to that is to increase the resources available to government in order to achieve uh, these investments in infrastructure and in, in human capital and so forth. And IGC has worked with the Federal Board of Revenue and I was very pleased that the chairman is here with us today uh, in a project to make better use of data in order to increase the revenues from the income tax in important projects that we'll hear about later today, I've been working with the Excise and Taxation Department here in the Punjab to do the same thing with property taxes here in the Punjab. Fundamental to the, the effectiveness of government is, is ex uh, having access to the resources necessary to undertake those essential investments. The Minister also mentioned the uh, crucial role of increasing value addition 
uh, throughout the economy, agriculture, manufacturing, and elsewhere, and as I'll come back to in a few minutes, that too is a central focus of our research uh, agenda, as is understanding uh, the private sector, which is so much at the heart of, of growth. Let me give you two slightly more extended examples just to illustrate how the IGC at its best uh, works in these partnerships. One is one that Dr. Khan mentioned at the outset. There's a project in Zambia where we've worked with the Ministry of Health. All developing countries face challenges in the health sector. Uh, delivering health services effectively to rural areas and fighting the drain of health professionals who too often after receiving their training find more lucrative, more attractive opportunities in developed countries. The Zambian Ministry of Health decided that it would try to address some of these challenges by identifying and training candidates in rural areas to become community health workers. They adopted an ambitious agenda of training 5,000 uh, community health workers over a five-year period. IGC researchers Oriana Bandiera, who's at the LSE, and Nava Ashraf, who's at Harvard, worked with the Ministry of Health to identify the key challenges facing that program and the successful rollout of that program and agreed with the ministry to embed research, to embed evaluation into the rollout of that program right from the first day. So in the first 48 districts where the government advertised these new positions of community health workers, Oriana and Nava worked with them to divide those districts into two random groups so as to test what recruitment strategy would be most effective, most effective in attracting skilled candidates and most effective in attracting candidates who would then on the job be most uh, productive. One of the key questions was whether it was better to appeal to pro-social motiv motivations, to community orientation, or instead to career ambition in terms of attracting the two. So, in 24 of these districts, the ads that went up in the community said, do you want to serve your community? Become a community health worker. Whereas in the others, the posts were advertised with posters that said, become a community health worker to gain skills and boost your career. Campaigns. So practical results, so doing came out of this new knowledge generated by the project. Let me give you another uh, example in the uh, Gujarat in India where the State Pollution Control Board was interested in whether the auditing policies that were in, uh, part of the common practice for monitoring pollution by firms uh, were effective and working with Michael Greenstone uh, at MIT with Esther Duflo, uh, Nick Ryan, uh, and others. Uh, they developed an approach where they introduced a new uh, ad auditing strategy. So the existing one was one where firms hired the auditors themselves, uh, paid them themselves, uh, and of course looking at that from the outside it was quite clear that there was a disturbing alignment financially between the interests of the firm and the interests of the auditor. The auditor seeking a renewed contract had an interest in not uh, creating uh, problems for the firm. So, so the researchers proposed an alternative uh, mechanism for auditing, which was one where the auditor selection would be centralized uh, in the hands of the control board, who would randomly assign auditors to the different firms each year. Well, what did they find when they compared the impact of these two strategies, the privately hired auditors with the centrally hired auditors. Well, they found that in the first instance, those hired privately under the original scheme were much more likely to falsify their reports. A concentration of firms were, were reported as just satisfying the pollution control regulations. Secondly, the reports of auditors under the new scheme, the randomly chosen centrally hired scheme, were 
to the extent that it was possible uh, to test uh, statistically through measuring pollution uh, emissions, reporting the truth. That is, their reports really aligned with all of the evidence available in terms of the true levels of pollution. Third, and perhaps most promising, on average, those plants with centrally approved auditors as opposed to privately hi hired auditors reduce their pollution on average over the course of the year. Here too, the findings of research fed into policy in a real-term way and led to practical changes in the approach to policy. Uh, in the state, these, these guidelines have now been incorporated into the policy framework. But not only that, the results, have the results have contributed to a better global understanding of these issues. This, uh, re the results I've just reported to you have been published in January of this year in the Quarterly Journal of Economics, one of the lead journals uh, in the field. Just a final example, uh, in the case of firms, John Sutton, a professor at the LSC, has produced a series of enterprise maps mapping the firm capabilities in five different African countries. And these enterprise maps have now fed into policy in, very, uh, in a variety of important ways. In Tanzania, which has recently discovered natural gas, as you may know, and is now expecting a, a sharp rise in inward investment. Uh, John has worked with the government to design a new approach to local content so that when this investment comes in, it will work to kickstart industrialization in Tanzania by creating linkages to international supply chains for domestic firms in transport, in construction, in food services. John's also been working in Ethiopia with the, the investment authority there, realizing that most employment is generated by large firms and an investment agency with limited resources is much better advised to focus those resources on building relationships with large firms so as to generate the maximum employment impact from the investment that comes in. Well, let me finish just by highlighting our ambitions for this second phase of activity in the IGC. And our ambitions really lie primarily in four areas that we see as crucial to growth and crucial to the development of effective growth policies in our partner countries. The first of these is state effectiveness. Without an effective state, it's hard for any development to take place and almost impossible for the private sector to generate rising incomes. One part of our research agenda looks inside the black box of government to try to examine and understand better the factors that determine government's ability to raise revenues, as we've talked about already today, but also the ability of government to deliver effective public services, as I've mentioned in the example in Zambia. Another part of our agenda under state effectiveness is to look at governance and issues of political economy, the challenge of strengthening public institutions to ensure that governments serve the interests of the many, not the few. The second and broadest area of research in this second phase focuses on firms and aligns very much with the Minister's seventh pillar of this 2025 strategy, which is the private sector and its crucial role in, uh, in achieving and sustaining growth. Successful growth policies must be rooted in an understanding of what drives firms' productivity. It's only with increasing productivity that economies generate rising incomes. John Sutton's pathbreaking work I've already mentioned has focused on, on some of those generators. He's identified how large manufacturing firms often don't start as small manufacturing firms. They start as large trading firms. Where that dynamic exists, and it's pronounced in several African countries, policy must respond to that. It's no good throwing resources at SME programs if none of your SMEs ever graduate out of being small businesses. If all of your startups stay in the garage, then it's no good focusing all of policy on, on, on uh, interventions that are aimed unsuccessfully at trying to help them move on.
But part of helping those firms to grow is to get inside the black box of firms. And Eric Verhoeven, who's here, has done pioneering work in understanding the role of innovation in boosting firms' productivity. Nick Bloom, another researcher at the, IS, at the IGC, has done pioneering work in understanding management practices, so getting inside the detailed operations of firms to understand these important determinants of productivity. All too often, if we look at the economies in South Asia and in Africa, a crucial problem is this cluster, this huge cluster of small, unproductive firms. Until we begin to address that problem in a serious way, it'll be very hard for these economies to shift to sustained high rates of growth. The third key research area for the IGC is cities and the challenges of urbanization. If we look at developed countries, we realize that cities are drivers of economic growth. They're the location where the bulk of economic wealth is created. But if we look at developing countries, particularly in South Asia and Africa, cities are too often dysfunctional. And it's not surprising because cities are very resource intensive and they're also very policy intensive. Without highly effective government and without substantial resources, it's impossible for cities to overcome the challenges of congestion, the challenges of pollution, the challenges of crime. And the path taking in cities affects all the other areas of development. Take just energy use, our fourth area. If India and China were to follow in their urbanization strategies the model of Hong Kong, then the significant increase in affluence that will happen with urbanization will be accompanied by only a 30% increase in energy use per capita. If instead, India and China follow the example of the US, energy consumption will rise by 130%. So urbanization strategies matter also for sustainability. And that relates to our fourth uh, and final area, which is, which is energy. As we've already uh, discussed uh, yesterday evening and has been mentioned today, one of the greatest challenges to growth here in Pakistan and in, in uh, most developing countries relate to energy. Access to energy in rural areas, problems of energy theft and sustainable, sustainable supply, sustainable energy sources and the role of renewables, and the challenges of managing the very substantial externalities associated with the sharp increase in energy use that will be necessary to achieve higher rates of growth as these countries develop. By driving forward research in these four areas, state effectiveness, firm capabilities, cities, and energy, with our 15 country programs, the IGC is, we believe, in a unique position to contribute to the country-specific knowledge necessary for effective growth policies, while also building a global knowledge base that will help countries around the world to support sustainable growth. Thank you.